Hello, good morning. Welcome to Study the Word. This program is sponsored by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at 948 South Geyer Road in Kirkwood, Missouri. We're glad you've joined us, folks. In just a few moments, we're going to be dealing with this week's Bible question that has come our way. We had part one last week. We're going to have part two this week. Um, before we get to that, of course, we've got the phone number on our website up there for you to check out our website, our location, our times of services, because we'd love to have you come and visit with us. On our website, we also upload our past TV programs. Check the archives. All the Bible questions and answers can be found there. And, of course, the phone number is there for you to participate. If you have a Bible question, uh, we get questions all the time, and I've got a backlog, which is great. We'll eventually get to them. If you have a question, we'll use it on this program. I'll put that phone number again up for a longer period of time at the end of the program because we have a number of free Bible study helps that we offer to you, our viewers. So what are we talking about today? Well, let me just introduce what we talked about last week. And if you didn't get to see that, of course, you can go to our website. We upload our past programs on there. But last week we dealt with the question. It was actually two questions. Um, why do you believe that there is a God? Why are you so convinced that God is real? And why do you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God? Well, we said, well, I really couldn't do it in one program. So last week we just focused on the evidences, the proofs that God is, that God is real. That is not something that we have made up. There is a, there is a lot of evidence to prove that, that God does exist by just looking out in creation and seeing the design and knowing there had to be a designer. And we pursued that line of thought last week. Well, we're going to continue on now. And we had to do it in that order, because why would we even begin to talk about the Bible being the inspired word of God if God doesn't exist? If he doesn't exist, then this is just made up by man. It's it, The thoughts and everything that's in here has come from the mind of man. It's not divine. It's not inspired if there is no God. But folks, there is a God. And God spoke. Not only because the Bible says he spoke. We're going to look at some external evidences as we go through our study today, so we hope you'll stay tuned for the next half hour. Now, it's important that we go to the Bible and, and establish the fact that it says it's inspired. So, well, Chuck, the fact that it says it's inspired doesn't mean it is inspired. Well, first things first. I mean, if, if you were to come up to me and ask me something about, okay, where I was born, and somebody's told you, you know, that guy there, he's been, he was born in this particular place. And you come up to me and you say, hey, were you born in this particular place? And I said, no. Well, then you're not going to pursue it any further. If I say yes, then you might ask for additional evidence. But it does start off with making the claim. So does the Bible claim to be inspired? Yes. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 16 and 17, it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, you can also go to Hebrews, the first chapter, where it says God spoke. It just comes right out and says it. God spoke. Well, let's think about that for a moment. Knowing that God does exist, why do you think God needed to speak? Well, obviously, when it comes to a family unit, parents speak to their children. Why? Because they love them. They want to communicate love. They want to um, give them laws. They want to educate them. You know, these are things that are very important. They want to guide them. So words are very important. And, they, and we speak them in the family situation, and we understand that. How much more so when God created this world that he saw the need to make sure that he communicated to them? Now, if God doesn't communicate to us, and if we don't have it written down, and it being inspired, and we'll prove that, if, if, if we don't have this, 
then how will we know what God wants? Now, this is a problem that exists in the religious realm today because a lot of people will say, well, I feel that God thinks that God will approve of this and I feel that God will approve of that. Well, once we remove the Bible out of its equation, we're in some serious trouble. So why, you know, that, that, what that means is that why would God even have a standard then if, if, you, if just whatever, whatever somebody thinks is right? And that's what goes on in the world today. That's why we study so many other things on this program each week. We deal with a Bible question and we look at the Bible answer. A lot of people don't like the Bible answer because they want to do what they want to do. They want to believe what they want to believe, but they don't want to listen to what God has to say. And that's nothing new because that's what happened in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. There's Eve. The serpent approaches her in Genesis chapter 3. And the serpent says, what has God said? And Eve just repeats what God said. You know, don't eat of this particular tree. Uh, if we do, you'll surely die. And the serpent comes back and says, no, you won't. No, you won't. And so she gets thinking about that. And she gets looking at the fruit and she takes it. She just, she just disobeys God. She did what she wanted to do. That's the problem. See, God can provide his word. But he can't make people believe it. He can't make people obey it. Now, he can hold people accountable for that, and that's another subject altogether. So let's, let's talk a little bit more now about some evidences. Okay, Chuck, I want you to prove to me what's the difference between this and one of these other books. Let me just, I'll just grab a book out of my library here. I'll just grab this book. And here's a book that was written by some man. First name is Jim. This, this guy wrote this book. Now, but what's the difference between this book and this book? Well, what we're saying is, this is inspired, this is not. What we're meaning is, the thoughts that come from this book came from the mind of man. Everything that's contained in this came from God. I'm not saying God said these things because there's quotes in here of what somebody said or what somebody did. What we're saying is, God inspired people to write down accurately the things that transpired. Matter of fact, when you go through the Bible, there's over 40 different men that recorded things here over a span of 1,500 years. And these men came from different backgrounds. Some were rich, some were poor. And when you think about that, they lived in different places, um, lived at different times. All these 40 writers didn't know each other. And when you live at different time periods, how could they? Well, what's so important about that? Well, when you have that kind of information about how many people wrote it and over a period of 1,500 years, yet none of the things that they wrote contradicted each other. That's interesting. This Bible is full of facts that harmonize. It's a theme that runs through the whole scriptures. And so the fact that there are no contradictions and that it has endured over time. People have tried to destroy the word of God. It's still the, the, uh, the most printed book in the world, the Bible. And, of course, it provides answers to things that man could not possibly ever know if they weren't recorded. First two chapters of the Bible tells us about how the world began. How did man begin? It, it talks about that. And so we couldn't possibly know that. Now, people like to speculate, you know, people who don't believe in God. So, well, there was a big bang, you know, and there was an explosion and then, all of a sudden, there was spontaneous life, and, or something came from nothing. That's rather interesting. That kind of applies to last week's program. Big Bang, you know, energy. Where did that come from? See, these are questions that we have as thinkers. People might think that people who believe in God and believe in the Bible are not thinkers. They're blind followers. It's actually the opposite of that. I'm not going to believe the Bible is the inspired word of God because somebody tells me it is. I want to see the evidence. And you know, in our program, I look down and I see we got about uh, 15 to 
to 18 minutes left in this program, it's not near enough time to talk about all the things and all the proofs that I could present. So let me just go ahead and tell you now that I would love to sit down with you and present more information to convince you. It, it doesn't bother me if you say, well, Chuck, I don't, I don't believe the Bible is the word of God, but, but I'm willing to listen. Well, that's all I ask. You know, you don't have to believe in the, the inspired word of God before we can get together because we can talk about it and I can present the information for you that we might not be able to cover today. And so what are some proofs of inspiration? Well, one of the first things that I want to present is archaeological proof. Now, there's a lot of them. Archaeologists have been digging up for years history. The Bible is full of history. The Bible talks about the time when the uh, the Assyrians were a world power, the Babylonians were a world power, um, the Greeks were a world power, the Romans were a world power. And when you read about these biblical characters living during those time periods, there's a lot of names and dates, and it would be very easy to prove the Bible is wrong because it gives so much information, so much detail. And with archaeologists uncovering libraries, secular libraries, of information about these kings that existed and how long they reigned, nothing contradicted the Bible. They uncovered kings like Nebuchadnezzar. Well, the Bible talked about. It's not a surprise that these archaeologists will uncover things that harmonizes with the scriptures. We're not afraid of people uncovering things. Keep digging. The more information you find, the more it confirms the scriptures. I don't mind secular history. I've got a book in my library over here by a man named Josephus. He, here's a historian during the time of Jesus. It's just a, you know, it's, it's a Roman historian. Here he is. And he's writing about the events that are going on in Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. Now, he's not inspired. But I can pull out that book by Josephus, and I can read in there where it says, there's a disturbance in the city of Jerusalem over this man named Jesus. Really? Yeah. You know, because you got secular libraries from ancient history, and... It harmonizes with everything you read in the, in the Bible. And so when you, when you think about that external proof, it just adds to the validity of the inspired word of God, the information that we find within here. You know, there was the great flood. It was confirmed, you know, and I've got the information written down here by these expeditions. And, and so we have this um, British Museum in 1912 confirmed the fact that there was a, a great flood. Uh, the walls of Jericho that you read about in, in Joshua chapter 6, it was confirmed by Garstan in, in 1929 to 1936 during their uh, archaeological date. The famine in Egypt that's talked about in Genesis chapter 41. See, because when you read that story, you read about the fact that Joseph interpreted the dream of Pharaoh and said, now look, there's going to be a seven years of plenty followed by seven year famine. And Joseph said, you know, you need to store food for those seven years of plenty to get through the, the lean years. Well, there had to have been some rather large vats to contain all the grain to help them through those seven lean years as they saved and stored for those seven prosperous years. And by the way, folks, we find out that they discovered that in Egypt by Petrie, which was in 1912. The list goes on and on. Do you realize there was a time when archaeologists said, you know what, we've read the Bible, and it talks about King Belshazzar, it talks about the Hittite people, and they said, you know what, we've never uncovered anything about them, and therefore the Bible's not reliable. And then what happens? They turn around and they make a discovery with secular history that there was such thing as the Hittite nation and King Belshazzar. What does that tell you? It tells you that if they haven't found anything yet, they need to keep digging. 
We're not afraid of the truth, folks. We've often say that, say that on this program. The only thing that suffers from investigation is error. And so if a person is in a part of a religious group and they're teaching things that are wrong, or they're wondering whether it's biblical or not, we examine it on this program. We're not afraid. If we're wrong, well, that's a win-win situation. If we find out we're wrong, that means we must have found the truth and we can take a hold of it. If we find out we're right, well, that's good too. And so we should never be afraid to examine the evidences that are out there. And so many times people want to just disprove and cast off and say the Bible is just a book of stories made up by man that are just not true. Wait a second. Where'd you get that information from? Am I just to just accept it because you said it? That, it, that it's, these, these stories are not true because you said so? No, when we look at the evidence that is out there to support the proofs that are there, what's, a, what's another evidence that we could look at to prove that the Bible's inspired? You know what? Scientific accuracy, which is rather interesting. Scientific accuracy. You see, the information found in here is older than, I'll just grab this book here that I showed you earlier, I pulled out of my library. This individual, he, did, he didn't come up with knowing things before they actually were discovered. But you know, it's interesting that the Bible made mention of things such as what? Well, in Isaiah chapter 40, it made mention of the earth being round in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. Well, Chuck, what's so big about that? Well, it wouldn't be so big of a news flash if it was written yesterday, if Isaiah was written within the last 50 years. But no, Isaiah was written hundreds of years BC before man discovered that the earth was actually round, is my point. The Bible, how did they know that? Well, we can throw in there the suspension of the earth. There was a time, in Job chapter 26 and verse 7, there's a time where people thought that the earth rested on something. And yet, here's Job talking about something that he may not have understood, it, but it was a fact, a scientific fact that was recorded in the scriptures before man even discovered it. Leviticus chapter 17, 10 through 16 talks about how there's life in the blood. You know, you don't have to go back hundreds and hundreds of years, but you don't have to go back too far where people thought that when you were sick, you just had to drain blood, like the, the blood is bad. That's what doctors thought. Now we've since learned that that's not the case, but way before that, it was told in the scriptures that there's life in the blood and you don't do that. You know, in Psalm chapter 8, talked about the fact that there are paths in the sea. We know them today as the shipping lanes. The Bible talked about it before man even discovered that. And, and my point is, the list goes on and on and on because we're talking about where are the proofs? Where's the evidence that the Bible is not ordinary? Where's the evidence that the Bible is inspired, that it is it came from the mind of God? Well, that's what we're talking about. Well, what else can we talk about? Well, we can mention in the Bible, there's fulfilled prophecies. Now, it's important to keep that in mind. Books that were written hundreds and hundreds of years before the events actually happened. Let me just give you a few. We could spend hours talking about these, but let's just mention a few about Jesus. Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus comes on the scene, says he would be born of a virgin. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, it records, and that was recorded hundreds of years after the fact, that Jesus indeed was born of a virgin. His place of birth, Micah talked about that in chapter 5, verse 2, and it was fulfilled in chapter 2 of Matthew, exactly the place Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Details of Jesus' birth. It's amazing. If you go to Isaiah chapter 53, you sit there going, how in the world did Isaiah know in such detail how Jesus would be crucified hundreds of years before it even happened? Because he's writing by inspiration, folks. That's the key to all of this. You need to understand that. And people might say, well, you know, maybe Jesus knew how 
Isaiah said he was going to die, so he was just going to die that way. Well, you can't make the soldiers do the things that they were prophesied about. That was something they did on their own. But how did Isaiah know this? Again, folks, we're talking about the fact that it is the inspired word of God. And that he would resurrect. Psalm chapter 16 and verse 10 and in Acts chapter 2 talks about the fact that Jesus resurrected. In chapter 1, he mentions that too. And the latter part of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus died and he resurrected. It was foretold that that was going to happen. There are so many areas that we have mentioned, and there's so much more information we could provide to show that this is not an ordinary book. And like I said earlier, with all the information that is in here, the people that don't believe the Bible is inspired, it should be so very easy for them to discredit it. What do you mean? Well, I touched on it earlier a bit when I said, you know, it has names and it has dates. It would talk about geography. Now, we all know in times past that maps were made and they had to be changed over time as they gained more and more information. As old as the scriptures are, and yet we know that there were quotes in there about a, a day's journey or to such and such a place, and they come to find out later on for our time period that that was accurate uh, when it talked about going down to jerusalem well wait a second how how is that possible when they were at a place that was that was uh further um south see if you're if you're south and you're going north you say you're going up we do that if i go up to see family in canada i'm going up to see them or down to Florida to see family. We understand that premise. So why did it talk about Jerusalem going, you know, it would use that phrase of, you know, I'm going to go down to Jerusalem when where they were was south was because of sea level. They were actually literally going down to Jerusalem, which is accurate. And so again, the, it's these little details if you want to put the Bible under a microscope, that's fine. But all the details that you read about in those dates, they're accurate, folks. If you can find one error in here, it will discredit it. But God made sure that his word was preserved. And we know why. Because that's what a parent does. A parent talks to his child because he loves him and cares for them and wants to protect them. God created us. And he loves us so much, he made sure that he spoke and that his word was preserved and it has been kept accurate all these many years. You can trust the scriptures, folks, to be inspired. Now, like I said, we only had a few minutes to talk about a few of these things, but if you would like to talk more about these things, we'd be glad to do it. We'll sit down, look at those evidences, because we don't want you to believe it because I said it. That, that would be wrong. Okay, And you don't want to just reject it because somebody else told you, well, it's not inspired. If anybody tells you it's not inspired, you need to ask for the proof. Where is it? So at the end of our programs each week, we want to let people know that you can learn a lot from the Word of God, which is why we offer a Bible course that encourages you to get your Bibles open at home, to read certain passages and to Answer these questions and get to know the Word of God, folks. Because God wants us to hear Him. He wants us to obey Him. There's information in this Bible that you need to know. This Word of God is for you. Yes, it's for everybody, but it is for you. And you need to learn it. Would you like to take this free six-lesson, this six-lesson home Bible study course? We'll mail that first lesson out to you tomorrow. But we just need your name and address so you can text it. A lot of people do that. Or you can call and leave it on voicemail, leave your name and your mailing address, and we'll get it out to you. Nobody's going to show up at your home, folks. You know, unless we're invited, we're not going to do that. And we will wait till you, we receive your lesson back because we provide a return envelope with a stamp on it. You work at it at your own speed, and we'll return it to you with your next lesson until you finish all six. When you're finished, you'll have a pretty good idea of what the Lord is wanting you to know about his word. 
Not only that, each week we tell you that we can go ahead and put in these two pamphlets. There are people who are saying, here are 40 things that are found in the Bible, but they're not. They're saying they are. They're getting in the pulpits across the land and on TV and on the radio and saying, here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible really doesn't teach it. You need to look at those 40 things. And these 30 things are also saying, getting on the radio and the TV and places and saying, this is not in the Bible, so don't believe it. Yeah, they are. And there's a list of 30 things that people are saying are not in the Bible, but they really aren't. And you can look up those verses and read it and say, wow, it really is in the Bible. Why would they say that? I'm not here to, to explain why people do what they do. I don't know why people would say the Bible doesn't say something when it really does. And I don't know why people say the Bible does say things that it doesn't. I don't want to put words in the mouth of our Lord. So you need to take a look at those folks, and I'm sure it will stir up some questions. You can be put on the mailing list for a weekly bulletin. Um, again, no charge for this. Every couple of weeks it'll come with some short articles. No, I'm not inspired. These are not inspired. This correspondence course is not inspired. I said, well, Chuck, I thought you were just talking about the importance of inspiration. I am. Whether it's the bulletin, the pamphlets, or the correspondence course, they are designed to get you to open up your Bible. Read what the Word of God has to say. We don't want to create man followers. We want people to follow the Lord. And the only way you can do that is not listen to man, but listen to the Lord. And that's what Paul said in Galatians 1. He said, I, I'm speaking by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, there's one more thing that we can offer you folks. If you're really eager to learn, we can have a face-to-face -face Bible study. Set it up at a time that fits into your schedule. We can meet at your home, coffee shop, at the church building, join a small class, whatever you're comfortable with. It fits into your schedule morning, afternoon, or evening, during the week or on the weekends. If you want to have a face-to-face -face Bible study, let's do it. And uh, if your lady will bring somebody with us, with me so you won't feel uncomfortable, maybe my wife or somebody else. Um, but we just want to encourage you to learn to obey the Word of God. And that's what this program is all about. Folks, if you're ever in the Kirkwood area, we would encourage you to come by and say hello. We get TV viewers all the time that'll show up and, you know, somebody will go up to them and say, hey, what, what brought you here? And they will say, Oh, uh, well, I was watching the TV program, and y'all invited me to come out. <laughs> Boy, that just makes our day. Come by. Say hello. Observe. We won't put any pressure upon you. We don't want anything, but just come and, and participate in our worship service. We meet every Sunday morning for a Bible study at 930, 1020 for worship, and then 5 o'clock in the afternoon for another hour of worship. Midweek Bible study every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Classes for all age groups, folks. Come and participate. We'd love to have you. We hope that you'll tune in next week because we have a, another question that has come from one of our viewers that we're going to be dealing with. And so we hope you'll tune in and we will study the word. Thank you folks for being with us and have yourselves a great day.